innovation and defensive mechanisms and responsibility of tactics to acquire control of the situation, with a reach out to Sanitation, Attack and Post, Boys and Girls. And it's become pretty uh, well known that the most uh, potent hack to take over device is the Boys and Girls. The Boys and Girls were created to reduce the risk of radio spy control while paying a, a, a sufficiently high premium. Now, however, the main mechanism for disciplining managers nowadays is really shoulder activism by hedge funds. And hedge funds, generally speaking, don't seek control of corporations. They're really trying to use the democratic means within the corporation to try to pressure managers to uh, um, pursue certain uh, strategies. So the question is, how did defensive tactics evolve in response to this hedge fund activism? And there's some anecdotal evidence that you know the terms of the poison pills have changed. So as I'll show you a bit later, uh, basically the poison pills have lower trigger threshold. Historically, they used to have 20% trigger threshold. In the media, in 2013, 2017, our sample is 10%. Uh, we've seen the evolution of net operating losses here. So what is net operating loss? Companies can deduct NOL. Uh, from uh, future profit, but they can lose the ability to do so if somebody acquires 5% and later acquires control of their corporation. So what companies did is that the companies that have NOL basically adopted NOL sales, uh, so tax purposes has a 5% trigger threshold. And this trigger threshold is particularly restrictive for hedge funds that don't seek control of corporations. There's also a proliferation of acting and concept provision that basically aggregated ownership states for the choir for the purposes of triggering uh, poison pills, which means that the effective trigger for each uh, acquirer is, is actually a, a bigger one. And finally, there is uh, some policy questions in the background, a recent Delaware case with a company, basically how the pills against a general or a hypothetical threat uh, of activism is generally uh, uh, basically illegitimate, right? So there's a question here, how big is this? Uh, so just to give you a sense of what's going on in the database, this is the trigger threshold of poison pills um, in three periods, 2003, 2007, 2008, 2012, 2013, 2017. The 5% trigger uh, pills are basically NOL pills. So you can see that the percent of NOL pills has basically increased to almost 40% of all pills in that period. And the median trigger threshold shifted from 15% to uh, 10%. Okay, so what do we do in the paper? We basically, we document systematically the contractual innovation in the terms of poison pills. We examine uh, really the extent to which pills are adopted in response to uh, hedge fund activism. Uh, we tell, test whether these pills are consequential, whether they constrain activist attempts to influence current policy and assess uh, policies on anti-activist anti uh, This is a rough outline of the paper. I already told you we document uh, contractual innovation for the pills. One thing, additional thing we do in the paper based on uh, work by one of our authors, uh, Tanya Kimson, we basically develop a proxy for activism threats based on the number of edge fund clicks on SEC disclosure documents. So I'll get to that in a minute. But the basic idea is that we don't really, you know, we don't really observe whether or not there is an activism threat in any particular time because you know there could be an activism threat even if the hedge fund didn't acquire five percent of shares of the company and basically file the 13B. So we need something else uh, that um, will proxy for the activism threat even if there's no 13B file. So the main findings in the paper, poison pills are significantly more likely to be adopted following an increase in edge fund clicks on uh, firms' filings. Uh, the association between pill adoption and the clicks is driven by pills that have design features that target the edge fund, things like uh, lower trigger threshold. Uh, a firm is less likely to be a target in a 13D filing by hedge fund when it's adopted poison pills, so basically it's, uh, you know, the pills are consequential. And interestingly, the results are driven in part by these NOL pills that have a 5% trigger. And again, these NOL pills, just to remind you, they are uh, mostly designed uh, uh, as such for tax purposes, right? To protect the NOL of the company. Okay, so you might say, um, you know, there's some reasons to think, question whether or not poison pills 
can actually curve uh, stock accumulation by accurate hedge funds. And I'm going to take each of these in turn before I show you actual uh, data. So first, activists buy small stakes in corporations, a median of 7%. They don't usually trigger the typical ownership threshold when I show you the median is 10%. Well, it turns out that when we looked at the Perkins data on Perkins defiling, a sizable percentage of activists in the event actually involve more than 10% uh, of beneficial ownership. It's about 25% of the Perkins defiling. Second, bills that have a 10% threshold increasingly have acting in concept provisions, which means that the effective trigger threshold is actually lower. And finally, this is an argument made by Khan and Watt. Because the proxy, uh, the cost of intervention and, and, and running a proxy context can be very high, if you count the percentage ownership uh, of hedge funds, that could actually deter activism because they wouldn't actually uh, get to a sufficiently high percentage of the stock of the company and make enough money, basically, through your intervention in order to justify the cost of intervention. Second issue, you might say, look, NOL bills are not really about activism, they're about NOLs, right? It's about tax issues, it's about uh, the, the, the acquisitions that can destroy the tax benefits of NOL. Well, it turns out that uh, we found uh, a lot of memos that basically suggest that companies actually do adopt these NOL bills in response to a hedge fund uh, activism. Uh, so this is a memo from Morgan Lewis and uh, Bookings LLP. Second thing, which is very interesting, about 20% of NOL bills adopted in 2013 to 2017 are acting in concept provisions. This is a provision that has nothing to do with the, uh, with the tax code. And finally, and perhaps most convincingly, if you look at the, how these NOL bills are actually drafted, the definition of beneficial ownership in NOL bills doesn't actually track the definition of Section 382 of the tax code. Uh, it includes it, but it also makes references to Rule 13D uh, and voting control uh, uh, rather than a, uh, just the economic benefit as in the tax code. Third, you might say, well, uh, information on hedge fund shareholding is not really publicly known until they file a 13D and, uh, because they cross the 5% uh, threshold. How can companies even respond to this? Uh, uh, these, these threats. Well, first there is a very good uh, uh, evidence of abnormal turnover spikes in both threat and defiling, uh, possibly because of information uh, leakages from brokers employed by, by hedge funds. Uh, we actually talked to at least one consultancy firm that specialized in DTC setup <coughs> trends and activist training patterns, and they advise companies on identifying potentially uh, hostile positions. So there is some kind of intelligence around this. And finally, sometimes the hedge funds actually communicates with the company, right? Before they, they try to do something, so they engage with, uh, with the company behind the scenes without a public campaign on the third day. Okay, so this is the data in the project. Uh, you know, we document a lot of things, anti-activist provisions. Uh, we also document uh, things like uh, shareholder votes. Uh, another provision I'm happy to talk about this as well uh, in the Q&A. Uh, a key component of the paper is this measure of a hedge fund trace, which is a, a, the proxy for uh, hedge fund threats. So it turns out that uh, if you uh, click on the SEC website between 2003 and 2017, uh, your uh, IP address is right there on the SEC website and it's available for a FOIA request. Uh, it's encrypted, uh, but what we do is we basically decipher the, uh, actually the, the specific IP address using um, a cipher table from uh, a paper uh, by Shen Al in the Journal of Financial Economics. Uh, what we do is we merge this, uh, the name of the IP addresses to the name of hedge funds, and we get the IP addresses of the hedge funds, uh, basically from the American Registry to Internet Numbers, uh, and that's how we create this measure of how many clicks uh, were made by hedge funds in any given period on, you know, on, each, uh, on the disclosure document of each company. Uh, we managed this in financial data. Uh, final sample includes uh, 7,000 firms and 200,000 uh, firm quarter in your uh, observation. Okay, I already showed you this uh, uh, figure. So this is uh, to give you a sense of the number of points that close over time. Uh, so you can see all pills in the gray uh, bars, but you can also see the pills with a 10% trigger or lower. These are the ones that arguably you know, more likely to target activists. So even though there has been uh, a decrease in general over the years, 
in the number of uh, new poison pills, uh, we can see that the number of uh, anti-activist pills, or addictive pills that have a lower trigger, hasn't really declined and stayed at least relatively, increased initially and then stayed relatively stable since around 2008. So, as I mentioned, we're also seeing the evolution of, anti, um, of acting in concert provision. So you can see in the latter part of uh, the sample, uh, we can see that about 30% of poison pills are acting in concert provision. What is interesting is that even if you look at pills with a relatively low trigger, so the, these are the NOL pills, that have a 5% uh, trigger, and the 10% pills, you can see an increase in this acting in concert provision, which means that the actual trigger uh, for potential requirer is, is actually lower, right? Because you aggregate the uh, uh, ownership states of any acquirer of the shares of the pill. So this is the first visual evidence uh, of that uh, adoption of poison pills follows uh, you know, an increase in hedge fund clicks. So what we do here, uh, we basically plot the mean hedge fund clicks uh, before and after uh, pill adoption. So the T equals zero is the quarter from the time the pill was adopted and uh, 90 days uh, afterwards. So you can see a spike in hedge fund clicks right before the pill adoption and then it gradually So uh, this is just an anecdotal example uh, to give you a sense that there's something going on um, when uh, hedge funds are clicking on disclosure documents. So in 2012, um, you know, basically Elliott Management initiated dialogue with the management of BMC uh, software. Uh, and um, uh, what you can see is that the, you know, this really started in the first quarter of uh, 2012. Uh, you can see an increase in the number of clicks uh, right around the time. Uh, BMC responded by issuing a press release and adopting uh, a poison pill. So this is just kind of to validate that something is going on uh, when uh, we, we can see that you know, hedge funds are, are clicking on SEC disclosure documents. Uh, this is just a little bit of a historical trend. Uh, there's a lot going on here. But if you just focus on the red dots for a second, these are basically the percentage of pills over time that follow at least one uh, click by a hedge fund. And you can see that the percentage has generally increased over time, right? So over time, you know, arguably more uh, pills are responding to these clicks, which is a proxy uh, of hedge fund issuers. Okay, so we use two main simple uh, specifications in the paper. One of them is to see whether or not the clicks the hedge fund clicks, this is the uh, HF clicks variable, uh, predicts pill adoption, right? Very simple. Uh, uh, we use parametric effect and tactics effect to know the regression. Uh, and the second one is whether or not uh, poison pills affect the outcome uh, of hedge fund activism. And we mainly focus on the probability uh, that the firm will be subject to a protein defiling and an activist uh, intervention. Uh, in the second specification, we're mostly looking at the interaction between pill adoption the previous, in the period, period before a protein D filing, interacting with, with, uh, you know, with the hedge fund clicks in the previous uh, period. Okay, so this is just a, a main, uh, uh, one of the main results in the paper. So as you can see in the uh, uh, first few columns, uh, using different measures, uh, basically uh, a pill adoption uh, is, uh, you know, so the hedge fund clicks uh, predict Pill adoption, uh, and we think that this is economically meaningful. A one standard deviation increase in hedge fund clicks is associated with 48% likelihood of uh, um, pill adoption. Uh, the as compared, just to be clear, as compared to the anti-traditional mean, which is relatively low uh, because the number of observations uh, where you actually see a pill adoption in, in uh, panel data of quarterly observations actually relatively small. Uh, now, uh, one thing to emphasize is that this result is basically driven by new pill adoption, right? Uh, and we basically use this placebo renewal of pills, right? So the company is just renewing the pill as a routine matter. Or, uh, other, you know, we also make a distinction between meaningful modification and other modification. 
uh, meaningful modification is something like, you know, when the company reduces the trigger pressure from 52% to 10%, for example, then we can see that we get uh, uh, um, some statistical consistency is maintained as well. When we look at meaningful modification, there's no, um, no result uh, with respect to either one. Also, very importantly, uh, we split the probe by different characteristics. So you can see that hedge fund splits predict uh, the adoption of pills that have a 10% trigger or lower. Uh, they predict the adoption of annual pills, right? The pills that are adopted for tax purposes. Uh, and pills that have a acting constant provision. On the other hand, again, even in placebo, pills with a trigger of 10% trigger uh, don't seem to be um, correlated with hedge fund. We then look at uh, whether or not those affect the likelihood of a certain B finding. Again, the variable of interest is the hedge fund splits in the axis of the poison pill adoption. When we look at all poison pills, we don't get a statistically significant result. Uh, but when we look uh, at uh, annual pills or uh, pills that have a 10% trigger uh, with an acting in concert provision, we get a statistically negative, uh, uh, statistically significant and negative coefficient suggesting that uh, these fields reduce the likelihood uh, of uh, approaching the filing uh, by an action. On the other hand, when we look at uh, poison pills uh, that we define as non-activates, is basically those that have more than 10% uh, 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 trigger, uh, we don't get a statistically uh, significant uh, result. Okay, so we do a bunch of robustness tests in the paper. Uh, first one, we're trying to sort of uh, consider whether or not the nonetheless these fields are uh, uh, driven by a desire to, uh, of the board to protect the firms against takeovers. And one thing we look at is the hedge fund strategies. We basically look at whether or not the specific hedge fund typically seeks uh, a strategy of trying to get a company acquired, right? Because hedge funds often do that. And we had different measures of, play, of hedge fund placed on company disclosure documents based on the strategy uh, of the hedge fund. And we showed that the results are not driven by hedge funds that typically seek the sale uh, of the target. We also have specifications that exclude takeover bids and takeover movements, and the results are actually, uh, uh, are actually strong. Finally, I want to conclude actually with a few potential policy implications of the paper. So the first one, I think that which is, seems to be a little bit straightforward, is that annual pills uh, should not be used against active, right? And there's very easy ways to do that. Uh, they can be drafted to strictly tra track the tax code. That would be one very simple way uh, uh, to do that. Now, it's also important to remember that uh, arguably firms that have NOL, have net operating losses, are the ones that most likely could benefit from hedge fund activism, right? These are not the highly performing firms. So it could be particularly troubling that um, companies um, tend to do that. Now, it's also important to mention in this respect that Delaware law treats NOL pills very leniently and actually, you know, basically doesn't uh, review them. And the ISS, for example, um, doesn't condone directors, doesn't condemn directors, sorry, uh, who adopt uh, annual pills. Second implication is that a uh, board should be transparent about the purpose of anti-activist pills. Uh, if you look at all these pills, okay, uh, you know, including those that have 10% trigger and acting in concert provision, they basically, when the board adopt them, they always say they adopt them because they're concerned about the risk that a raider will acquire control of the company. They never say that it's about activism, right? Uh, so, uh, and, and that applies actually even, uh, applies also in the, uh, in the, in the case, uh, in the wooden company's case where they adopted a 5% pill that was not an annual pill, right? So they never say that the pills are against activism, right? So I think the board should be transparent about it. And maybe there's a need for clearer legal standards to distinguish the pills that entrench managers and the anti-activist pills that protect long-term value. Like if we take the, basically the Williams company case as stated, uh, then you know, if we argue that uh, 
you know, that basically adopting poison pills against, against the general threat of activism is illegitimate, then arguably all the pills that I showed you in the picture, you know, that were adopted in recent times, you know, should be invalidated, right? But if we believe that uh, perhaps um, a board should have some power uh, to uh, protect companies uh, from uh, an activism threat, then we need a better uh, standard for uh, defining the circumstances in which they can do that. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you so very much. I look forward to your comments. Delighted to be discussing um, the paper. So, over did a, a terrific job of presenting the paper. So I'm just going to do like my one slide summary of what the paper's about, um, and then I'll give you sort of some thoughts. So, what does the paper do? Well, they study the rise of anti-activist poison pills. What's an anti-activist poison pill? Well, it's a pill with certain characteristics, right? And certain, some of those characteristics, the key ones, as I understood them, lower trigger thresholds, acting in concert provisions. Um, and these so-called NOL pills. Uh, and so, what do they find? Well, it turns out that firms that appear to be the subject of interest by hedge funds um, are more likely to adopt such pills. Okay? And the, how do they know that? Well, they use um, this clever data set, right? hedge fund clicks on issuer SEC filings as a proxy for their interest. Because that way, we can see there's interest before they actually go ahead and acquire and not to actually file it. And it turns out uh, pills that make it impossible to acquire substantial ownership stakes are associated with fewer such stakes. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of, as I understood it, uh, the big takeaway from the paper. Now, um, I want to take a moment over and talk more about the institutional setting here, which I think was great, than there was in the paper. The paper, I think, was a little thin on institutions, so I would encourage you to put more of that in. Most of my comments are going to be about use more of the texture. And right? so here's some more of the texture. Here's what's going on. Um, first piece of institutional setting, Delaware law. What is Delaware law? Well, okay, this is why it's important. Uh, pills that make it for practical purposes impossible, okay, it's not like formally an impossibility, but for all practical purposes, impossible for an investor to acquire shares past a certain predetermined threshold. It could be 20%, could be 10%, nowadays apparently it could be 5%. So these were developed by Marty Lipton and company right, back in the 80s, back in the mists of time, uh, to deter takeover, takeover attempts uh, by corporate bankers. So the idea, well, let's force the raiders to negotiate with the board rather than buying up shares on their own. The most recent famous example of a traditional poison pill that was adopted was, of course, Twitter. Right? The board adopted a poison pill to deter Elon Musk. That turned out to be great for shareholder value because maybe not so great for Twitter, but the shareholders got 5420, and that's way more than they would have gotten otherwise. And so that's a poison pill doing what it's supposed to do to deter a takeover. And the takeover still happened. Right? It just happened through negotiation. <coughs> now, there's a different business model at play when we're thinking about activist hedge funds. But what do these guys do? They buy a chunk, you know, I kind of have in mind 5 to 10%. That seems consistent. Uh, we've got over 7%, you said 7% with median. Okay, fine. Uh, and then they push for changes. Right? Those changes could be a proxy contest. It could be a seat on the board. It could be general changes in the way the business is run. It's a big variety of things that people do. Now, I don't want to get into this fight. There is some evidence, I find it persuasive, other people don't, that you know, the threat of hedge fund activism increases shareholder value. I think it's clear, the authors don't come out and say it, but it's pretty clear from the valence of the paper that they think activist hedge funds are generally a good thing. Let's not have that fight. Um, that's a different fight. Okay. Uh, so what does Delaware law say about all of this? Well, poison pills that are designed to address the threat of takeovers, generally permissible. Again, lots and lots under that hood, generally is doing a lot of work here, but that's the general gist. In contrast, right, we know from In Ray Williams, just 2021, the Lower Chancery decision, a pill that addresses a general threat of activism. That's the story. So that's the first important piece of this change in fact. The second is this tax step. Right, so I know nothing at all about tax, but I want to learn some stuff in order to do this discussion. And this is what I learned. Um, okay, so this bit I knew beforehand. Many companies have tax losses. Tax losses sound bad, we don't like losses. But these net operating losses are great because they're assets that sit on the balance sheet. Now you know as much accounting as I do. Right? And you can carry them forward to offset future profits. So that makes them valuable assets. We want to protect them if we want to protect shareholder revenue. And so evidently under applicable tax law, um, an ownership change jeopardizes what exactly is 
and ownership change? Well, it sounds incredibly complicated, but what I could discern from my research was that if you were a 5% shareholder or more, right, and you increase your ownership by at least 50 percentage points above your lowest percentage in the last five years, um, then you're going to have an ownership change. And the rules sweep in groups of shareholders acting in concert. Okay, so what's the punchline? Once a shareholder or group of shareholders owns 5% or more, then changes in their ownership can lead to reduction. It's not like a total write-off, but there's really complicated formulas. But the point is it jeopardizes these NOLs, and of course this risk is increasing in the amount of the NOLs sitting on your balance sheet. Because right? the more you got, the more you have to lose. So there's a challenge here. If I was a shareholder in one such company, I would very much like the board to protect my NOLs. That's a valuable asset. So what we want to do is distinguish the bona fide NOL pills, the ones that are protecting shareholder value, from these sub rosa anti-activist pills, right? the ones that are management entrenched. And that's really hard to do. And so what I encourage the authors of this paper to do in the next version of the paper is really dig in and try to distinguish those things. And I have some thoughts on how to do that. Okay, so again, I have the unenviable task as a discussant of this paper of coming up with like things that are not perfect enough. So I have spent a lot of time uh, looking for shortcomings. You know, I, I think the authors are pretty upfront about the limitations of the current set. And so I, I kind of came up with three. So the first is there's this ambiguous causal mechanism, right? The authors are very upfront about this in the paper. There's no clear link between these clicks and the poison pill adoption. Right? There's some stories we can tell. Um, and I appreciated that in the presentation there were some anecdotes. I think those in the paper would really help uh, to build up that story. And I'll say more about that. It's a limited time period. Right? So the authors can't take advantage of the motivating decision. You use the Williams case to motivate the whole paper, but Williams is in 2021 and your sample ends in 2019, so you can't even use it. Right? So that's too bad. Um, I have thoughts on how you can bring it in. And then finally, it's a really unclear normative takeaway for me. Are, am I worried? There's a balance in the paper that these are entrenching, these are bad. Um, but it's not totally obvious to me that they're all bad. Let's see a bit. So, uh, my main suggestion, and everything I'm going to say is going to kind of orbit around this, the real gem, as I read the paper, is the granular pill data. You guys went through and read all of these pills. Take better advantage of that. Lean into that. Right? So, rather than, you know, regressing a noisy proxy on categories of pills, uh, you know, dig into the governance implications of the granularity that you're seeing. Tell us a richer, more textured story, right? which is what you started to do in your presentation. And that's what I would encourage you to continue to do. Okay, let me talk a little bit more. Uh, the authors can collect detailed data on poison pills. And uh, as you heard in the presentation, right, in the later part of the sample, they observe an uptick in pills that are likely to hamper the I think the authors frame this as a problem. The idea, while well, they're using these NOL pills, and the other low trigger pills protection. But surely some of these pills do protect shareholder value. The question is, which ones? Now, I went and did some homework to figure out what we already knew about these pills. I mean, it turns out we knew a fair amount about these so-called anti-activist pills. Um, their existence certainly is well-known in the literature. Uh, so as always, when it comes to corporate governance, Ed and Marcel already wrote a paper about this, because they always did. Um, and of course, you cite this in the paper. So they talk about this, they talk about the case law, they talk about Implications, blah, 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 because they always do. Uh, and of course, there's a multitude of law firm reports, practitioner pieces going back to 2018, talking about these and how they can be anti activist, right, and how they can use not be. And of course, obviously, the Delaware Bench knows all about this because they've been adjudicating these cases for years. And the fact that NOL pills can be used to deter activism, again, that, that was known by all of these very clever people that have been talking about this for five years. We take a further step back, right, and we think about the evolution of poison pills overall. So you showed us in that slide, starting from 2000, and I don't remember what it was, but if we go back further, the high watermark of poison pills was actually in the early 2000s. So evidently, uh, I looked this up, I don't want to take the number, back in 2002, 60% of S&P 500 firms had a poison pill. It's enormous. So my data are not nearly as good as Oprah's. I pulled this from ISS Governance. This goes back to 2016. Now we look at S&P 500 companies, we're talking about 
2% have a poison pill. And if you look at the mid-cap 400, uh, you're looking at 2%. The small-cap 600, you're looking at somewhere between 1% and 2%. And even in 2016, it turns out 3%. Now, I'm very jet-lagged, so I didn't want to have to do math while I was standing here. So I put the count on a separate slide. Right? How many actual companies are we talking about? We're talking about like 20 companies. Right? There's not very many companies in other words. So what's nice about this is you can actually just dig into what was going on with every single one of these companies because there's like 20 of them. Right? And you can get all of that texture and you can tell us the real story here. Instead of like running regressions where I don't know where the variation's coming from because there's like 20 firms and you've got firm fixed effects and year fixed effects and all sorts of other things going on, just, just look at what's really happening in the world. Okay, so in other words, situate this in the broader context of a poison pill. What can we learn from the changes in this space? Again, the paper has this super strong normative valence. It didn't come out quite as strong in the presentation, but in the paper it's really there. Super skeptical of management. But of course, at least some of these pills probably have some legitimate reason. And if you're sitting on a big stack of NOLs and your risk of losing them is there, you've got to protect that. Now, there's some language in the paper that reflects the trade-off, right? So you say in the paper, well, the time period has gotten shorter. Well, that suggests that you know, there's a trade-off there. More of them are requiring shareholder votes. And again, a trade-off there. So you, you, you know this. I know, I know you know this. Uh, but tell us more about that trade-off. I mean, that would be really interesting. Take it seriously. Okay. I'm going to be old-fashioned. I'm going to say that ultimately what we care about is shareholder value. I hold that position. Sorry. Um, and if that's true, then I think there's a more nuanced story here. Um, we can talk about other things you might care about, but I care about this. Okay. So here are some questions that this raises. Um, why are certain companies adopting these things? Don't give me a regression. Just like read it and tell me what it says. Okay, the total number is really small. The other thing I'm really interested in is how many dogs didn't bark? Right? How many companies that are sitting on big stacks of NOLs didn't adopt NOL pills? Because that's kind of weird. You're running a really big risk that somebody could come and jeopardize a big asset of yours. That seems like a problem if the fiduciary is doing that. How many companies lost substantial NOLs because they didn't protect them? Um, and how many companies, you know, had a bunch and ran the risk and maybe got off the I think I would really want to know the answer to all of those questions. Okay, so that's the first part. I'll be quicker on the next two. So the hedge fund clicks data. Super fun data set. They have access to SEC filings as a proxy for hedge fund interest. Right? And so the idea is that, well, if a hedge fund is interested in a company, probably you're going to go look at their filings and see what they say. And so the authors find that hedge fund clicks predict kill adoption. Again, strong negative valence here. There's a thought in the paper that they're protecting themselves against these activist hedge funds. And, and it, uh, almost certainly there is some element of that going on. The question is how much. Right? So again, the authors are very upfront about the fact that they can't, you know, the companies can't observe these clicks. So it cannot be the case that the company is seeing them. And so there's some thought, maybe what's going on is engagement, if there's that fun story of Elliot, uh, could be rumors. There's, you know, if I really wanted to get picky here, I could even conjure a story where there's reverse causality, right? A rumor gets out that a company's about to adopt one of these pills, and people get curious, and they start checking the SOC to see if they've done so, and then they find it, and then they're like, oh, yep, they did. Okay. We can't actually distinguish them. I don't really think that happens. Right? So let's just put that aside. The normative implications, even just putting that aside, are really unclear, because if this is a legitimate pill to protect a valuable asset, then that's exactly what I would want them to do. Right? If I'm running a company that's sitting on a big stack of NOLs and I get wind that a hedge fund might come in and jeopardize this asset, you, you should protect it. And right now we can't tell the difference. I would like to tell the difference. So I guess my big suggestion here is that rather than having the clicks be kind of like the core of the paper, that should just be like a sideshow, one part of the paper, and then the real story is about the evolution in this one. And that's just one piece of the bigger collage. So, some questions that this raises. Right? What about the propagation of all this really interesting heterogeneity? Where is that coming from? Uh, what's driving all these differences? Right? Again, don't give me a regression. Just tell me the story that's going on. Are there certain law firms involved? Are you, you kind of get very upset 
that they're defining acting in concert using the SEC definition and not the tax definition. I mean, it could also be that they're just like not that sophisticated. And the people drafting these things are the corporate lawyers and not the tax lawyers. And they probably should be the tax lawyers, but it turns out that not everyone is perfectly perfect. Uh, so you know, that's a possibility. And lots, lots of work that's been done looking at propagation. Uh, I think that would be a super interesting application. The other thing I want to know is, well, what happens after? You say in the paper that most of these pills are short term. They're like one year. Well, life is long. One year passes that one. And what happens later? Are these all renewed or do the hedge funds come back? Like, what's the story there? Again, these are 20 companies. So we can know the answer to that. Then what happened after Williams? Right, 2021? Well, we've got two years that have passed since then. Uh, the decision motivates the paper. The click data don't let you study it because the click data end in 2017. Uh, but if you move beyond that data, you have a possibility of losing. Okay, super fast. Um, this is just a quote from the paper. Overall, our findings provide strong evidence that poison pills affect the likelihood that a firm will be directly targeted at hedge funds. Um, you know, this one is particularly strong for pills with low triggers and acting in constant provisions. Okay, so this is a bit of a cheap shot, but like, isn't this relationship kind of mechanical? I mean, how can I put another way? It would be really strange if a pill with a 5% threshold didn't deter 13D filings because I don't know what that means. It means the pill was like waived or somehow they triggered the pill and they did it anyway. It's strange, right? So this almost has to be true. So it's fine to note it, but I wouldn't make this like a headline finding um, because yeah, it would be strange if it weren't true. Okay, so again, the, the short term 13D filings are not that interesting. Things we care about are much more interesting. Right, so the, all those long sets of and then the other thing I would just reiterate here, I think it's worth trying to give management a fair shake. It's possible that some, maybe even many, of these are meant to entrench, but I think it's a better argument to make that better if you at least entertain and take seriously the possibility that some of these are actually just them being the fiduciaries, copying and pasting language from previous pills, Right, okay, fine, they took the language from the securities laws, not the tax law. How different are they? Maybe they're close enough that nobody really noticed. I, I don't know, but I think it would be a stronger argument if you at least entered. Okay, so wrapping up, great data. Um, the granular data on these pills I think is super interesting, and congratulations on doing the work to actually dig into them. Uh, right now, I think concerns about identification are really constraining the payoffs that you can get from the data. Right? And so I would just forget about you know, identification. Forget about that. That's not the interesting part here. I think what's interesting here is the institutional setting and all that granularity that you have. And so I would just focus on that and retool the paper uh, around that. And so with that, uh, thank you. small 
in, in some periods, like in COVID 2020, there was a huge spike of about 70,000. You know, me and Mike Richard wrote a paper about it, about five, six thousand dollars. There were actually about 70,000 um, in uh, basically in one quarter. Uh, another comment I want to um, talk about, which is um, about the normative aspect of the paper. Um, I think we try to be careful not to say these are good or bad. Maybe we didn't do a good enough job, uh, and we, we got to look into this. Um, but uh, you know, there are some obvious empirical issues, right? We're actually saying whether or not pills are good or bad, and we typically rely on red studies, right, and, and uh, show all the returns. Um, very tentatively, because we're still cleaning up some parts of the data, you know, what you usually see actually is that um, prior to the adoption of the pill, usually you can see a trend of students going out, and then they continue to go up right away, right? So there are multiple ways uh, you could interpret this. Um, and, and let me just say, this is actually consistent with some anecdotal evidence. The most uh, recently, uh, the company Carvana adopted an annual pill. And if you go to Capital IQ, actually look in, you know, Capital IQ gives you timely, sort of, they don't keep their data, but the, the timely the data on ownership, and you can see that there's lots of hedge funds actually uh, that bought shares in uh, Carvana. And what happened afterwards is the, the company actually adopted various, um, uh, various uh, uh, different policies, they sold some assets, right? So I, I think there's a, there's, a rich story, there's a rich story to tell here. Uh, maybe they adopted it, as we argue, in response to the actual threat. Um, but maybe also management actually decided, you know, because of this active threat, and because the company was underperforming, to later do a bunch of things that actually increase your the value, or at least perceived by the market as a good so, so I agree there's, a, there's more to uh, explore uh, in that direction. Uh, we don't know, um, you know how to distinguish annual pills, the true annual pills from the natural. I mean, basically do it with the clicks, right? Which is perfect, so, so I, I'm not sure uh, I have a better way at the moment. Um, we don't know who are the law firms that adopt these, uh, that have drafted these bills because they're not, you know, the AK don't, don't say them, right, which law firm. I mean, we can, we can do a survey and, and talk to lawyers. Uh, uh, we don't know the first annual bill that emerged in the 90s, and we can really track the law firm that created it. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to more questions, absolutely. Um, Elizabeth's going to start, and then Charles is going to take the mic. Thanks so much for an uh, interesting presentation and paper and excellent commentary. Uh, a few rapid fire questions. Uh, at first, I had the same reaction as Adriana about the kind of evident point or self evident do pills affect the likelihood of 13D filings, especially if what you're measuring is NOL. But then it gave me a deeper thought is why does the 5%? Why does NOL definition coincide with 13D? I'd be curious to understand that better. Um, another question that I have is, um, why should we care if it's just, when I looked at your slide 12 about the going up and down by a little bit, about 20 pills a year, maybe you could answer that to motivate it more. If, you're, if your time period doesn't go up past um, Williams Company, then at least motivate more. Like, why should we care if it's just going up and down a little bit 20 pills a year? And that's where I think the suggestion about the tracing the evolution of the contract drafting is really interesting because you can just ask, like, ask David Silk, well, tell, like, talk to some folks and tell us more about the details of how the like acting in concert provisions are drafted, or maybe do some language search to like tell us more about that because that would be interesting in documenting something different, as I remember the um, Ed and Marcel paper doing. Uh, and then third, uh, the doctrinal point. You know, I've been in many uh, wonderful conversations about Delaware m and law, and whenever you hear somebody like Leo Stein or somebody talking about what they're doing, they explain that the Unifal standard is exactly to smoke out the motivations of, of the directors. 
And so if, you, if your implication at the end, the point that you said was to, that uh, what your policy implication was that we need a clearer legal standard to distinguish, well, we have many decades of the Delaware courts using Unical to do that. And so I want to know more specifically what you think we should do about Unical. Thanks. So we group these together because the list of uh, you is really long. <laughs> Just quickly on this question of uh, is this entrenchment or le or a legitimate uh, use? Um, I wonder if you can just quantify for us the actual risks that firms face in terms of the expected value of the NOL that's lost if the pill weren't in place and you know activists come in. I think that could be really useful. It's one thing if you're losing you know 20, 30 percent of the pill, and it's another if it's basically nothing and kind of an empty threat. Uh, yeah, just uh, to pick up on um, something that I think came up in my commentary, I think Adrian had, uh, had a slide on Section 382 itself, which is a complete labyrinth. Um, but if you dive into it and try to work your way through it, there, there are a couple of trap doors in it. One of the trap doors is that for all of your shareholders that own less than 5%, they all get lumped together as a single public shareholder, and if their aggregated claims go up by more than 50 percentage points, that's going to trigger 382 as well. So I, one of the things I can imagine a board might try to do, oh, and, and by the way, the, the, there is a provision in 382 that says we're going to treat some people as a group, if they're in a control or ownership group, or if they're acting in concert. Completely undefined in the section itself, which almost makes me feel like well, where are we going to define it? We're going to define that in the pill itself. So I, I want to hear a little bit more about, you know, what does it mean for the definition in the pill to be consistent with the tax code, given the tax code doesn't really give us a definition and leaves it open to the pill's definitions itself. Uh, and what kind of already has Mike here? Uh, thanks. Uh, just uh, a couple of quick points. Uh, the first is relating to uh, your coding of acting in concert. It seemed to me that. Uh, uh, the coding essentially deals with the existence or otherwise of acting in concert, but as we see from the williams Stockholder litigation, uh, it's the nature and extent and scope of the pill that the acting in concert provision that matters. So is it possible to drill down further uh, into the nature of uh, the you know, uh, poison pill, uh, acting in concert is a question? And the second a broader question, I think it would be interesting to flesh out a little bit more about there's a lot of debate and discussion about whether the pill should be in the context of takeovers or activism. So how, how does a change of control differ from activism? Uh, I think if you can flesh, flesh that out a little bit more normatively, that would be great. Okay, so Yop and uh, then Martin, and then Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation. And, uh, I want to know about the impact of a shadow pill. I mean, because uh, the shadow pill is, I think, uh, very important. Uh, Delaware, uh, in Delaware, uh, well, the, it is a so-called, I mean, the, all 100% of the corporations have a really poison pill because they have a shadow pill. And uh, even if the corporations do not adopt poison pill uh, in reality, and, but from the, the ex ante perspective, hedge funds and other investors uh, the might expect that the target corporations will adopt poison pill at some day, and one day, uh, even if the target corporations do not really adopt uh, you know, the poison pill in the end. So what kind of impact of uh, shadow pill in your research is that my question? So my question, I think, is quite related to Charles's point. So what I wanted to think about is why one has to protect the company from hedge funds that would destroy value because there would end up they be NOL pill. Not because they would be hurting themselves but without a stake. And then I you know, get rid of the tax loss and hurting myself. So it seems strange to have to uh, protect oneself against it. And the only reason I can think of is because there's also entrenchment. And on net, the hedge fund gains more by getting rid of the entrenchment than they lose with the pill. And that's very related to a point simply that if the NOL isn't very valuable, then you'd lose less. And I want to second uh, Ariana's point about causality. So effect is a strong, a strong language that you use in the paper. Right? And Adriana mentioned the reverse causality concern. Another one is the omitted variable one. So if my story is that underperformance is what attracts the interest of hedge funds, and the management knows that they're underperforming and affecting hedge funds, and they just head off the pill. 
So it's a simple minute interval story that was also challenging the cause of the implementation of these results. Thank you. Yeah, okay, um, one of the interesting features is that you need to have operating losses to protect and to be able to utilize that. So I think, you know, going back to Adriana, like adding a little bit more flesh to it, is like trying to kind of like flesh out, you know, you have a two samples here, right? You have like every company that has losses and companies that don't have losses. And then within the universe of the companies that have losses, they should, some of them should have already adopted poison pills protect not necessarily against the hedge fund just because the risk, you know, if you have a significant NOL, you want to protect it regardless and like shoulders should be fine having it in place regardless. So I think that's an input in, you know, you can utilize that pretty pretty effectively to try to that a little more. So I wanted to second agree with you that the fact that the terms of appeal do not track section three eighty two is evidence of anything that carries. If you think about a pill, like seventy five percent of it is a writers is Pills are written in a very evolutionary manner, uh, with incremental, very gradual increments. Uh, nobody got a reward for sprucing up a pill. So the fact that the pill that's adopted in this case tracks the garden variety pill is not surprising at all to some extent. Uh, second, I would second Martin's point. You should probably zoom in to the types of firms that are more likely to adopt a pill. So far, you are identifying a of a panel with ER fixed effects and firm fixed effects. Uh, but you really want to zoom into the firms that are more likely to adopt the bill. Maybe you can narrow down your sample and focus on firms that have been underperforming some kind of benchmark over the past whatever many years or something like that. And that will give you more fine grained evidence of some of the dynamics that you seem to be uh, trying to tease out here. Wondering if you could use uh, the adoption of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which really reduced the corporate income tax and reduced the value of, uh, of NOLs. Uh, does that change anything? Uh, you would imagine that if it's really about value, then uh, it's less important than it used to be. All right, well, now's sufficient time to answer all these questions. <laughs> Seven minutes. Uh, okay. Um, So let me start with the NOL. Uh, one of the tricky parts about the NOL is that it's actually not reported accurately in the well-known databases. Um, I have some subset of the data that um, where it is reported accurately, uh, but but it's kind of tricky. We're using the imperfect computation measures <coughs> right now uh, as a proxy to control for that. Uh, and we have a subsample of the data, right, where we look at firms that have positive uh, NOL or uh, robustness based on this imperfect proxy. Um, but uh, I, we were kind of thinking about this more as a, as a, as a follow up part to try to drill down the ties to the previous question about trying to use these shocks to NOL and try to really um, understand the value of NOL. Think about NOL, in principle, that in itself. You know, arguably acts as a natural takeover measure because if it's priced in the market, you need to pay a higher premium for the, you know, to acquire the company, right? Uh, and these shocks can affect that, right? So, so that's a follow-up, uh, potentially follow-up uh, project that I'm thinking about, in part because it might require a lot of coding, of, of also the NML. Um, I want to tie it to maybe the, the, the answer to your question about uh, the shadow pill. So, so that's actually another sort of motivation for the paper. You're trying to acquire a company, the board, it doesn't really matter if the board has not the poison pill or not, or at least the board has a lot of time uh, to adopt the pill, uh, because, you know, because the Williams company is or the Williams Act, you know, for like, like a certain time that the hospital bill has to stay uh, in place. Uh, this is different here, right? Because uh, if a hedge fund is contemplating uh, an intervention, uh, and the board is maybe knows, maybe doesn't know that the hedge fund is uh, contemplating such an intervention, they have to react by adopting the poison pill. So adoption in the context of hedge fund matters. Adoption, you know, the actual date or timing of adoption matters less in the context of the takeover. What matters is the, is the shadow uh, 
He's the president of uh, Share the Hill. Um, Eric, uh, tax code is super complicated. <laughs> So that we definitely need to think about it uh, more. Uh, acting in concept provision, we haven't coded this yet. Uh, that's uh, hopefully in the works. Uh, that's the plan. Um, uh, let me see if I'm missing something. Um, using the subset. These are all, you know, there have been a lot of great suggestions, so I don't, I don't want to, uh, there's no need, no need to uh, uh, repeat them. Um, something like the Unicow. Uh, standard. Yeah, so I agree. It's really difficult to say what is a good or bad hedge fund intervention or, or bad uh, in, in using a legal standard. Uh, one thought that I have, uh, which may be uh, maybe unrelated to the actual findings in the paper, uh, is you know, one, one approach is that if you believe hedge fund intervention is always good, then they should be invalidated, maybe accept in extreme circumstances. Uh, like uh, you know, a financial crisis or something like that. Uh, but if you believe that managers should have some power, uh, maybe we should validate this anti-activist bill, okay? And maybe, I mean, this is just a thought, and uh, you know, we be happy to hear some comments on that in a way. Uh, but require boards to engage with the hedge fund, right? So you can adopt the poison pill, you know, but this is a little bit in the spirit of MSW, kind of the more procedural nature of uh, procedural approach to, you know, corporal standards. So that could be maybe one way uh, that I'm thinking maybe we can go about it. Um, okay, so I think that's all I have.
or in the field where you get more, well, what are you going to do? You're going to improve the um, field. I look for the improve the field. Um, ex ante at the investment stage, it reduces the maximum pledgeable payoff and therefore uh, makes it impossible to fund certain firms when they need to be, when they need to be funded. Right? Um, third, fiduciary duties potentially fix this. Um, however, uh, the most common version uh, discussed for fiduciaries in M&A situations, non-interference, uh, thankfully over just talked about stuff like that, um, having to um, let, letting acquirers go directly to shareholders doesn't help when you only have a single bidder because well, then it's good confounding you take it or leave it off of. Uh, Anti-self-dealing and, and rev on, and I'll explain what that is, um, do fix the situation to some extent, but they also reduce entrenchment. <coughs> the cleansing vote, and again I'll explain what that is, um, under the core and then value doctrine gets you back to square one because um, that is again resurrects and take it or leave it uh, nature of the situation that the shareholder finds themselves in. In fact, MFW's uh, shareholder vote condition makes the take it or leave it off incredible in the first place, so it really makes things uh, worse. And if there was a lot of uh, weird doctrine there for you, those of you not American lawyers, um, I will explain that. What I want to point out right away is that a lot of the action here is coming from the bargaining structure, hence the title of the paper. Uh, shareholders' inability to make a counter of it is the driving force of our, our paper, and that pops up in various places um, throughout the paper. Um, just to get set, set ideas straight, what is this paper? not about, this is not a paper about mechanism design contract theory, you take the basic institutional manual as given, basically out of Burkean and uh, respect for institutions that already exist, um, and because we want to talk to judges and we want to tell them why what they're doing is good or not good, and help them uh, uh, see clearly. Um, secondly, we're not about bilateral bargaining between the target and the acquirer. Our model actually generates some effects also on the acquirer. And Eric and, and, and Albert, who are here, have a paper that deals just with that. But we don't focus on that because we think of shareholder rights as being um, about the relationship between shareholders and managers, whereas target and acquirer would have to have that with a single owner. Uh, so it's a sort of uh, separate problem. And third, uh, we omit worse shareholder collective action problems. Um, there are legendary collective action problems of shareholders uh, confronting in particular two-tier front-loaded bids, uh, where you can really be stampeded as a shareholder into a tendering. We assume that that's solved, because since the 1980s it is solved, and so we're just dealing with what's left, which is that inability to make that kind of We're also not talking about what courts really do, and I describe the doctrine of the courts. I'm going to give you the headline doctrine. Uh, I think it is uh, the case that uh, railroad courts in particular um, actually have a much more subtle approach to uh, how they handle um, cases. Um, a lot of discretion, um, coming back to the first paper of the day. Um, we're not here to explain exactly how they exercise their discretion. We actually want to tell the judges, who's intuitively, why what they're doing is probably by and large correct. Okay. All right, so let me uh, start then with the key assumption, a point of the paper, um, which is dispersed shareholders' um, key bargaining problem, the inability to make counter offers. So um, dispersed shareholders cannot make counter offers. That's just a fact. It's a mechanical consequence of shareholders' dispersion. Shareholders can't speak. I mean, uh, an individual shareholder could speak, but why would they be uh, speaking for the shareholders at large, which shareholder would do that? Why would that shareholder incur the cost? Why would the others follow this one shareholders? Uh, and so, just as it's just in the nature of the beast, if the first shareholders they can't speak, and I'll make some caveats, a couple of slides on. What's the consequence? If you can't make cover of us, you don't get any surplus relative to your back now, the best alternative to negotiating. Um, in the one shot game, I make an offer to Tobias, Tobias can't make a counter offer, he can only say yes or no. That's obvious, it's an ultimatum game, it's very clear. I'm going to get all the surplus and the game theory. Uh, if you have multiple bargaining rounds, uh, the answer is a little more complicated, it's ultimately the same. Uh, as it's a finite game for the game theory, Simone, it's obvious, and followed by backwards induction. It's a potentially infinite game, 
I have this beautiful haiku here. I'm very proud of it, but I'm improving this. But in the universe of time, I'm just going to skip over it and directly to the paper. Caveats, just to um, not make you nervous in your seats. Uh, the stark conclusion is not the whole thing in the real world, uh, but we think it is most of the real thing in the real world. Um, or let me put it this differently. If you don't believe what we're going to tell you, um, then you must be believing in something else. Or you must be putting your faith in some other thing, and, and you must be supporting some other stuff. And so in that sense, it's almost like a more young Miller sort of type. If you only have our assumptions, you get this result. If you don't think this result is true, there must be something else going on. Um, so what else could be going on, or what else might be putting your hopes in? The central bargaining agent is the most obvious one. Uh, if somebody steps forward and negotiates on behalf of the shareholders and makes a counter of as the board or the manager of these then the situation is different, or it could be an activist shareholder, an activist hedge fund. Um, in a repeated game, reputation would kick in, and maybe any universal owners, institutional owners could have that role. Um, and then there's the rationality in scare quotes, because of course having a reputation for rejecting low offers is a good thing for real life. Uh, and so that's not really rational in the pejorative sense, it's just that it's not rational in the game theory uh, sense. We don't think that any of these are really particularly powerful, and we're just going to talk about the most obvious one, <coughs> the central bargaining agent. There's a principal agent problem. That's what most corporate law is about. It's a principal agent problem with the central bargaining agent. And so, um, Maybe you have faith in uh, the boards and managers doing, doing the right thing. If you do have that faith, much corporate law would be unnecessary. So I don't think we generally have that faith. And so we need to think about how to keep this uh, in check. All right. Having put down this, uh, this foundation, let's now talk about statutory rights and their shortcomings. Um, statutory rights leave no deal surplus to the ship. Uh, and why is that so? I'll start with appraisal. I promised you how to define it. It's in section 262 of the Delaware General Corporation Law. And it's a remedy where the shareholder in the trans control transaction can ask for cash instead of whatever is being promised in the deal. And the statute explicitly says that the shareholders get fair value exclusive of any element of value arising from the accomplishment or expectation of the merger. So it's explicit that the shareholders don't get any new surplus um, through the appraisal remedy. How about the vote? Same result. We just discussed this. Take your money with offer dynamics, no surplus for the uh, shareholders. Um, so note there, bitter competition is irrelevant because of the poison pill. Thank you, uh, Opa, that I need for just uh, explaining the poison pill. Um, poison pill gives the management and control of which deals can go to the shareholder, uh, and uh, the manager can therefore negotiate a deal with the bidder and then take that package to the shareholder who only gets to have this take it or leave it offer. If you think, well, that's not how it works in the real world, yeah, that's because in the real world we have fiduciary duties. So um, I'm going to talk about fiduciary duties in, in, in a second. Um, but before I do that, let me talk about the welfare effects of not giving the shareholder any of the real service. Um, Exposed, things are fine in terms of exposed asset allocation. Um, question, deal or no deal? Um, there we actually get efficient decisions. And the intuition is, if the shareholder doesn't get any surplus, it means all the surplus goes to the manager, which makes the manager the residual claimant, and residual claimants make efficient decisions. That's fine. So where do we get inefficiency? We get inefficiency in interim managerial effort allocation. The intuition here is that the manager gets all the deal surplus, but only part of the status quo value. So they're going to put more effort into creating a deal rather than improving the firm as a standalone concern. And there's even a perverse effect. The worse the status quo situation of the firm, the worse the um, shareholder's partner, and hence the more that the manager can appropriate transaction. The manager, by the way, could be controlling shareholder. There we actually know that this is happening. And the this is happening as well. We have data showing this sort of mechanism. And finally, uh, ex anti investment is impaired um, because the intuition here is that, well, if you give the shareholder less in the control transaction, then there's less pledgeable investment returns. And so there's fewer firms that can get uh, funded. Think of a biotech firm where almost all of the value is an anticipated acquisition by a big pharma firm. Okay. 
So there, if you want to fund that biotech firm as a startup, you need to be able to promise some of that payoff from the transaction to the investors who are putting money in um, up front. And uh, we have various results, not yet in the, pa not yet in the paper, showing that uh, it's always optimal to accept some exposed inefficiency in order to uh, give some surplus to the shareholders in the remaining deals. But uh, we haven't worked that out in all its detail, so uh, glossy. These would be pretty graphs if I had time. I don't have time. Right. Uh, so let's go into fiduciary duties. Um, first fiduciary duty, not US law, but UK law, and there it's not really fiduciary duties, but you know what I mean. Non-interference, what if the law prohibits the manager from interfering with bids going to um, the shareholder and removing the manager's blocking power? Um, well, then if you have multiple bidders, things are better, perhaps even good, because the bidders competing with each other will give some surplus to the uh, shareholders. Like they're having an auction, basically, and so obviously the shareholders are going to get some of the surplus being generated here. If you have a single bidder, uh, including in particular a squeeze out, well, then uh, non interference, almost by definition, doesn't help. And there will be a typical even offer made to the shareholder who doesn't get the surplus, so um, that's just not Better, what about anti-self-healing? Um, I'll start with the idea case. What do I call anti-self-healing? That's not the technical name in the value of doctrine. What it means is the manager can't take more than the proportional share, their, their proportional share in the deal. So if the manager owns 2% of the stock, they will get 2% of whatever deal price is paid in the transaction. Uh, and that's so normal that you might assume that's 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 always there, but actually the statute doesn't necessarily uh, say that at, at all. If perfectly enforced, this gets you the constraint first best. Uh, why? Because the manager will choose the deal only with the total deal price, which is greater than the status quo firm value. They get the same percentage of each, so they're going to take the one that generates more value. Um, before they ever get to a deal, they will exert equal marginal effort to improve either one. And, and of course, the shareholder gets a high return because they get part of the deal surplus and that allows more projects to be financed. Um, again, pretty graphs. Uh, unfortunately, in the realistic case, uh, it doesn't uh, work so smoothly. Why? Because the manager likely has private benefits in the status quo and or in the deal. And the status quo that might be perks, the power of um, running the running firm in time, and the deal that might be side payments, virtually cash to the uh, manager, uh, like, or, or maybe shares or an MBO. Uh, it could be liquidity to the manager. There are things that the manager gets that the shareholders don't get. Um, and, and that are not included, they're not counted by the courts when they look at these cases. The implication is that the manager's actual share, the percentage share of deal or a standalone value is different from the nominal share. Uh, courts only look at the nominal share. I mean, they, they, they are technologically constrained. They don't see anything. So they can only look at the, the nominal share. And then the effect of the managerial private benefits is that um, if they have private benefits in the status quo, their actual share in the status quo enterprise is larger than their nominal share in the status quo enterprise. So if they only get their nominal share in the deal, they will be less inclined to the deal, they will be entrenched. They nominally have 1% in, in the status quo value, but they actually get an, an extra 1% in private benefits, they actually have 2%. So they will need to have a deal that gives that gives twice as much value overall as the status quo before they're willing to um, accept that. That's entrenched. Sorry, I ignored my time short, so I'm skipping uh, all these pretty graphs. All right. Uh, Revlon, what does Revlon do? The Revlon tweak, I mentioned Revlon earlier. Revlon is a tweak on this. Revlon says that if the manager sell, if the manager uh, engineers the sale of the company, then the manager has to sell to the highest bid made to all shareholders um, collectively. So the manager can't prefer a bid that pays a higher side payment to the manager, but less to the other shareholders. That's the Revlon 
um, that's the background content. The consequent of this is, first of all, more traffic. There are some deals that the manager could have done without Redmond, but can no longer do with Redmond. So that means the, the manager will be less inclined to, um, to do deals. But if the manager does do a deal, they will select better deals because they won't take the side payments. The, the bidders won't compete on side payments to the manager. They will actually compete on overall price paid to all the shareholders come together. So that's, that, that's good. So there's a trade off there, but overall that's very good. And that's something sort of does some positive work. However, the problem we inherit the problem of the take it or leave it up re emerges when we get to the cleansing modes, which are flagged at the very beginning of my talk. So far, I've assumed that fiduciary duties are enforced, especially by post deal damages. However, in the last decade, the federal courts have cut off fiduciary duties if shareholders vote to approve a deal. That's the Corbyn Doctrine and the Family Doctrine. What does that do? That gives shareholders the choice of no deal or this deal without fiduciary duty protection. The choice that shareholders would want is deal with fiduciary duty protection is no longer on the table. If you vote against the deal, then well, there's no deal. If you vote for the deal, then well, there's no fiduciary duty. So you only have that choice. And so you have to go back to the same situation essentially as if they were not fiduciary duties as just under the statutory um, package. The manager knows this, kind of put on the table an offer that doesn't give the shareholder any service. Um, at the same time, the fiduciary duties are enforced, enforceable only by an injunction against the deal that the shareholder must, must ask for. Why? Because then the shareholder doesn't have, the ch again, doesn't have the choice of deal that complies with fiduciary duties. No, the choice is ask for an injunction, then there's no deal. Or don't ask for an injunction, or then you get the deal that the manager proposed. So again, you get back to this take it or leave it offer sort of fine nature. The way out here is a plaintiff attorney who will sue if and because the plaintiff attorney doesn't care about the deal per se, he cares only about winning, meaning the fee of all. That's generally seen as a bad thing. Plaintiff attorney misaligned with the nominal client, in this case the shareholder. Here it's a good thing because it's a commitment that the plaintiff attorney will bring the lawsuit even though exposed, it's no longer in the interest of the shareholder to do so. But then you reason backwards, the manager will know that the plaintiff attorney will bring this lawsuit and will have to structure the transaction in a way that complies with uh, it. And I would have loved to talk to you about MFW, but I'm out of time, and so I'll just leave this conclusion up there and so my discussion comes up uh, for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> So I want to really, first of all, I need to correct over slightly. You weren't the last speaker. <laughs> and it's now 2.52 in our time. Right? So whatever, whatever leniency you gave older, I'm going to ask for a little bit more. I also want to echo the thanks to ECGI and SNU for hosting us. Terrific event. I've never been to Seoul. I've been here less just about 24 hours, and I've already eaten live octopus, so <laughs> <laughs> can't, get any, can't get any better than that. Uh, we'll see. Um, so, and I also want to thank Holger and Liliano and the absent Ryan Love. Well, this was a fun paper to read. I'm going to try to get through these five points. Uh, I may or may not get them. The immediate track record suggests I will not, but uh, we'll, we'll do the best I can. Give you a little overview, three things I like about the paper things that need attention and some clarifications and some suggestions these guys might want to, uh, might, might want to chase down. So uh, let me just start with an overview of the paper. I'm a visual learner, so I'll put up a diagram associated with it. This is essentially the conceptualization of the firm inside this paper. You've got shareholders who own one minus S fraction of the company. You've got a manager who owns a fraction S of the company, so they add up to one, but also gets private benefits of control. And the idea is that these that this company may be sold to some outside acquirer, but the shareholders are only going to get an up and down vote on that transaction. And when it really comes down to brass tacks, 
the bargaining that's going to be going on here is going to be between the manager and the acquirer, right? So there's essentially kind of like two prices that are going to be paid here, right? There's going to be a price that gets paid to the shareholders, and if, they're, if all they have is an up and down vote, why don't you just give them their status quo value, right? Which is kind of the baseline part of this paper, and everything else, let's just split it up between the acquirer and the manager, all right? And so I think that's a, you know, it's an important thing to note. Other people have noted it, but it's a, you know, you, you sometimes see these M&A papers where it's, oh, we're selling the company. There are two prices here. There's the price the shareholders are going to get, there's a price that the incumbent manager is going to get, all right? And the result is you're going to get efficient deals because this person is going to be the residual claimant, but they're basically going to completely freeze out the shareholders of any of the surplus. That doesn't have ex post inefficiencies associated with it, but it may be ex ante inefficient. I'm going to revisit that a little bit later on. All right. And so certain shareholder protections, if done in the right way and the wind is blowing in the right way, may be able to remedy some of these problems. And the authors sort of take us through several of these um, potential possibilities. It's a little hard to tell how much they really want to celebrate the current sta state of Delaware law in, in this issue versus uh, do they want to kind of you know, push back and, and, and level some criticisms at it. And I'm, I'm going to try to help them with that. I'm going to try to give them some more criticisms than you of Delaware law. All right, so three things I like well, about this paper. Because there's like, I don't know, eight things I like. <laughs> three of them, well nine including the live octopus, and, and then three of them are about this paper. So first of all, obviously an important topic. Many people who talk about law and finance in a material way think about M&A transactions. That's one of the highest stakes transactions that you can have um, in, uh, in corporate law and finance. I also want to celebrate, and Holder and I have talked about this many times, I'm a big fan of bringing theory back to law and finance. Um, I'm a big fan of identification strategies as long as you are identifying a prediction about something, all right? And so uh, we, we need theory in order to inform those, and there are some practical insights. I, I like the fact that these guys are diving into what is the structure of M MFW, Corwin, and Revlon within one of the, I think, need attention in the paper. The paper is, at present, a hard read, all right? To get through the paper, I mean, it's not like there's incomplete sentences or anything, but it's, you gotta go slow and you gotta take notes as you're reading this paper. And I think there's a, you know, a couple of reasons for that. One, this is a preliminary graph. It says so right on the front um, page. I don't really, pre preliminary, I think, is a word that should exist in the English language that folks are not certainly helping. <laughs> but a lot of the analytic arguments are still being sorted out here. Uh, the audience is also kind of a, this is a tightrope walk a little bit, because you need, you know, your audience is people that are kind of like, they know the law, they're okay with Greek letters, and you can kind of, yeah, I'm part of that club, but I don't know how big the club is. So that's a, that's a bit of sense, I think. And then finally, I think the narrative presentation, and this is actually related to this first sub-bullet, um, the model's not that complex. It's a, largely a complete information model, but there are a lot of variables, 20 of them by my account. Um, the framework sort of goes off on little tributaries of dynamic game here, and, 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 and you know, on some level, you know, when I read a theory paper, I'm also kind of looking for a story, right? And so I, I found myself trying to organize all the different subplots of the story and the ones that didn't, kind of like a Faulkner model, they didn't, you know, they didn't all fully work out. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of feel like maybe as you, you know, continue to hone this paper, put it in a, um, uh, put it in a narrative that has fewer distracting alleyways to it. On some level, you can avoid some of them, and I get that. Here, by the way, is the list that I kept as I was uh, reading over the paper of the, of the variables, what page they're listed on, and whether they're observable and verifiable. And the one area that's not is on um, this sort of private side payments as part of the deal that goes to the, goes to the manager. I'm going to come back to that um, in a second. But the rest of this is you know, pretty much all sort of a perfect uh, or complete information. Bob. But on the variables per page, you know, we're one to one, all right? <laughs> all right, so uh, the second thing that I want to say just a few words about is just the role of models and assumptions, all right? And I, having already celebrated the idea of more theory work in here, I can't then start, um, you know, kneecapping the enterprise of developing models, right? Models are indeed abstractions, they're deliberate abstractions. That's a good thing because it helps us isolate some intuitions that we would not have already been able to isolate in themselves by allowing us to sort of hold 
sort of aside things that are orthogonal or noisy within that environment. Having said that, there are assumptions and there are assumptions, all right? And I have found that it's a, it's fairly a good organizing thing that I have is how do you, you know, separating the difference between a simplifying assumption and a critical assumption, right? A simplifying assumption is something that is largely independent or orthogonal to the phenomenon that you are studying and is unlikely to have meaningful interactions with it. A critical assumption is a little bit more, you know, um, you know or deserves some attention because that's going to be something that may be very much about the targeted phenomenon. And if you make an assumption there, then um, you know, one has to worry about the, the theoretical robustness of the result. Now, I want to pick on two of them here, the representative shareholder framework in the model and this, this unobservable variable that I talked about earlier, this kind of hidden side payment, under the table side payment to the director. So first of all, the representative shareholder framework. The way that shareholders are modeled in this paper is not as a disaggregated mass of individuals who are each maybe rational actors in an environment. It's done through what the authors call uh, you know, representing the shareholder framework. But part of the key driver of the paper, Holder mentioned it, as mentioned several times in the paper, is that shareholder dispersion creates this problem to begin with. This idea that shareholders can only vote up or down, they're dispersed, they can't bargain. All right? And here are many instances where they said it in the paper. But it follows with, but simplify things, we're just going to talk about a representative shareholder. And it's, it's actually not just a representative shareholder. There is one shareholder in this model. It's not a bunch of identical shareholders. There's a single shareholder in this model. All right? And the shareholder will act rationally, will you know, decide to approve something if they get at least their status quo ante, and will not do so otherwise. Now, why am I picking on this one? I, well, I think this, you know, for the enterprise here, for the paper that is motivated by the idea that we care about dispersal, dispersed shareholders, this is a critical assumption, it seems to me, all right? And uh, it's in direct tension with the fact that shareholders can't bargain, right? Just inside the model itself, transaction costs seem pretty small if you've got a single shareholder to bargain. So the authors immediately have to say, well, we're just going to assume that this single shareholder doesn't bargain, and maybe we bought back a lot of that, um, that, that uh, complexity. But I think it's stronger than that. Um, I, I think that there are some other theoretical and doctrinal implications of dispersed shareholders that um, are not going to make the cut when it comes to the analysis in the model. There are collective action problems of all different types. Holger mentioned some, you know, two-tier tender offers and so forth, that would cause shareholders to decide we're going to sell out at too low of a price. But there can be the other types of collective action problems as well if you put something to a vote of the shareholders. All right? It's not terribly hard, even with a bunch of identical shareholders, to generate voting equilibria in which everyone decides they're going to vote against a deal that pays less than a 20% premium um, and for a deal that pays in excess of a 20% premium. That is an equilibrium of a voting game, even with identical shareholders, uh, uh, you know, if they are if they are highly dispersed. The other reason why I think it matters is when you have a bunch of shareholders, they may have heterogeneous preferences that we may not know an awful lot about. And the voting exercise is at least one way to try to aggregate those preferences. All right, and so. By, by skinning things down to a representative and, in fact, unitary shareholder, I think we lose both of these things, and I think they can matter, particularly this, this, uh, you know, this collective action thing. It's part of Corwin and MFW, right? This idea that a shareholder vote um, can cleanse a transaction. One of the conditions for it is that it can't be a coerced shareholder vote, which is essentially legal speak for did you take advantage of a collective action problem amongst your shareholders. All right, second, the, uh, the unobserved managerial side payments. This is the one uh, variable that's not observable or verifiable. But this is, in fact, part of the core of the fiduciary duty part uh, analysis in the paper. But there's, I, I'm using more great letters than Holger did, which I find vaguely embarrassing because it's his model. But, um, but there's this idea that, well, it's not just these private benefits and control that everyone can see. It's that there might be a side payment that slipped under the table to uh, to our manager, um, and that may be part of what is motivating the manager in bargaining. The, the paper gives a somewhat optimistic view of 
using fiduciary duties, that sort of anti-self-dealing aspect of fiduciary duties to sort of you know, regulate some maximum amount or minimum amount the shareholders could get. That's the function right there. But you'll notice that beta is part of that function. And I don't really quite understand how a court will enforce it um, with, um, when the court can't observe beta and therefore doesn't know what that level is. And I'm not so sure that plaintiff's attorneys who are asking for injunctions is going to solve that. I think I want to understand a little bit more about how one elicits that information in a reliable way for, for a court if it's doing exactly the right thing to trade off these, um, these ex post and ex ante um, welfare uh, issues. OK, I just got a couple more points. One is a clarification wish list. It's not too long, but I, I don't know if you've seen the movie Office Space. Have you seen the movie? No, it's just going to have flat, so I'll <laughs> All right. But I'm kind of wondering what the managers do in this model. What's the, what's the manager doing? All right. Now, now Holger talks a little bit about all the managers out there, you know, but it's not a model yet, right? The, the, the manager's effort at trying to, to, to scare up and fire or run the company to make it more valuable. Um, and so it seems to me. There's kind of two, two reasons why you might have a manager. They don't really do anything, but they're indispensable for the operation. They just have to be there, kind of parked, and maybe extracting private benefits, or they have to be expending effort to promote and grow a company. Um, that's going to give rise to a variety of incentive constraints, participation constraints. I want to know a little bit more about when we think about what, that, what role that manager is playing. What's the first best or optimal managerial contract within this context? I know that Holger didn't want to make this a, you know, a, 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 um, a, yeah, a disclaimer, very lawyerly disclaimer slide at the, at the front end, but not making this about mechanism design or optimal contracting. But I do think this would be at least a helpful benchmark against which to say, you know what? If the courts did this, they could replicate a first best outcome. And I just kind of like that as a, as a comparison. So I think it probably would be something that um, that readers might want. There's no way I'm going to get through that. I'll, I'll talk to you guys about, th there's kind of an interesting modeling choice here in which you have in, in the multiple bidders where you have a bunch of bidders who are coming in. And the winner of the bid doesn't just get the, 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 the firm for what she bid. She then sort of sits down and bargains in a Nash bargaining kind of approach with the manager, with this, you know, the, the second highest value we're being an outside offer. And I, I want to think through that a little bit more. I, I, I think there are ways in which that's not, I, I'm not sure I agree with that sort of equilibrium structure. I'm not sure anything really hinges in the model on that. So you and I can uh, have a few and talk about that. All right, finally, just a couple of exe uh, extensions and generalizations, and then I'm done. So one. Appraisal, all right? So Holger um, described what appraisal is, all right? Um, and, uh, and then showed the statute. And he correctly showed the statute. The statute basically says, here's what appraisal is. And to the extent that this is not a normative paper, but a positive one, I think that's all there is to say about appraisal. But then you've got to wonder, hey, what if the appraisal statute, what if I gave Emiliano and Holger the opportunity to rewrite that appraisal statute, right? Would you write it any differently? than it looks right now. And I think you probably can. I think in this model, you can have a different appraisal statute that can help you navigate exactly the same trade-off between ex ante and ex post efficiencies. So maybe that should be an alternative approach, or at least another way to criticize Delaware practice right now. Maybe the appraisal, um, the, the appraisal uh, uh, calculus should be a little bit different. All right? Um, what about private costs of control? Right? We're talking about private benefits of control. But there's some famous corporate law cases in which it kind of looked like what the manager wanted to do know, was retire, go to like Miami or something like that. All right, and so uh, so you know Van Gorkum is one. The mind body case from earlier this year is probably another one. So how does the model sort of extend to situations where the manager is actually looking just to jump ship? Right, they're done, they're tired. All right, they had to manage through COVID or whatever. All right. Information structure, I would like to know a little bit more about um, you know, how this model would extend over to um, uh, more private forms of information, particularly amongst competing bidders. 
Right now, the model's got all bidders know exactly what all their valuations are. Uh, what if you put this in the context of an independent private values or a common values auction? Does that change any of the intuitions or not? That may also be true if you decide to blow out the shareholders. Do they know what their own private preferences are and willingnesses to accept might be? And then finally, and this is super gear heavy, but the more I sort of think about this, this kind of three-part bargaining game between shareholders, between the manager, and be between the acquirer, I start thinking, okay, well, you know, there is this literature on sort of the Nash core. What if you had an in-person Nash bargaining game? Now, those have been criticized, but there's been a lot of recent work on it. I cited a couple, Okada and, and, and Comte and Jehel, uh, have some interesting um, work on, you know, basically what happens when you have, you know, in-person Nash bargaining frameworks and coalitions form amongst them. Because that's kind of what you have here, right? You've got a three-person bargaining game and a coalition that's forming between the manager and the um, uh, and the acquirer. And so there are ways. This is a pretty nice thing. It's um, Comte and Jehel are, are, French, are French, but the paper is mainly in Greek. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, but it's, a, it's a nice paper because it really does sort of lay out how you can generalize this sort of multi-sided bargaining game with a cartel or, or a um, you know, particular coalition that forms. All right, and I think, yeah, that's it. That's all I got. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. It's an excellent comment. Um, I it's probably a bit of a weird experience for the audience to uh, hear me present the model without the model, and then the commentator to uh, talk about the many big letters in the in the paper. Um, I think this I, I mentioned this because I think it expresses that sort of shows the key difficulty in uh, writing this kind of paper. Um, we don't want to make it too complicated. We want to have the, the, the main payoff without bringing in too much um, technical machinery. And I'm grateful that you said we have too many variables. The authors don't necessarily agree, and I just say thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, should not, there should be fewer variables in there. Uh, on the point of the how we model the shareholders, be true. We, we, make this, we, we say up front, hey, multiple shareholders, they can't make, the first shareholders can't make counter offers. So let's just assume that they can't make counter offers, and then why do we need many shareholders? Just let's, let's just use one. That's just much easier to keep track of in the spirit of simplifying things. It's true that if we explicitly model a multitude of shareholders, then first of all, it become more complex technically. But it's also true, you're completely right. Uh, voting equilibria essentially can be arbitrary. If uh, no individual shareholder has any influence on the outcome, then anything could be sustained as an equilibrium. In fact, not voting could be sustained as an equilibrium, um, which then raises the question, like the equilibrium selection. Um, so maybe we need to revisit that. Um, but it will definitely require more variables if we, um, if, 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 if we do that. Um, anything else? Oh, yes, one point. Um, I didn't mention it. I think you only hinted in this direction. Um, what we, the, the different legal remedies that exist, ultimately, a lot of it hinges on implementability. What information does a court have, or could a court have, in order to implement? You're completely right. The beta, meaning what share of the year should, should the manager get, if the court has perfect information, and they, then they can pick a share, a paper. It's not surprising. Yes, they can pick a payment to the manager where the manager will always pick the efficient deal, that's, that's clear. But the information is generally not available. And um, one direction that we have thought about a lot, and as you know, Eric, I think you commented on this paper a year ago, a version of this, or you were at least in the room, we discussed it already. It was a different, mo different model, um, but the direction that maybe we want to add explicitly is these information constraints, I mean, the information requirements for the court. What's the information the court needs to have in order to implement these various uh, possible possible shareholder rights? Right. Let's start the discussion with more time than you have been collecting more. Yeah. Uh, thanks for a very interesting paper. Uh, just a couple of points. The first is, uh, I was, uh, you know, the way you presented the paper, Holger, uh, it seems like it's your model is transaction structure agnostic, uh, in a sense, because uh, you mentioned. Uh, 
uh, appraisal rights and uh, shareholder yeah. approval rights on the one hand, which seems to me uh, is applicable in a merger transaction, whereas when you went to the UK structure, you talk, talk about the takeovers. So the fact that uh, appraisal is available only in a merger and not a takeover, whereas because of Corwin, there's a little more convergence on the uh, approval rights. Uh, would that matter? Would the, would the difference in the transaction structure not matter yeah, in the shareholder rights uh, from the perspective of uh, you know uh, your, your model? That's kind of the first question. Uh, the second question is again, I'm thinking aloud. Uh, I'm wondering how the uh, existence of a go shop clause or a go shop provision will affect the whole matter because uh, if shareholders cannot counter offer. Uh, uh, and it is a coalition, as Eric mentioned, between uh, the board and the uh, acquirer. Uh, the existence of a go shop may actually break that coalition by bringing a new person into the game. Uh, I'm thinking of it, this new person, new acquirer, as a proxy for the shareholder, making a bargain or, or an offer on behalf of the, you know, uh, in a sense, counter to what the shareholders could make in that sense. So, how would the existence of a go shop uh, affect the whole market? Um, so, very elegant paper, only 20 pages, but not much story, and I like stories. So, when I was reading the paper, I was trying to imagine you know, what actually are the actors doing, what is the manager doing, uh, etc. And there is once, and you know, and I, I could see many things, but there's one element that I, I couldn't really reconcile with the model is the, um, is the, go are the golden parachutes. You know, they are the super bonus payoff that uh, is granted to a, a target CEO. And I'm under the impression this is, you know, something important in the dynamic of, uh, of, of M&A, especially, you know, so that, you know, we know they used to be introduced to just make uh, uh, CEOs neutral, perhaps mighty favorable to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the bid, but now, you know, with the change in um, uh, compensation uh, method, you know, there can actually be you know, huge, you know, huge, 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 huge payoff. And I, I just wonder how, where you, you know, whether it's part of your model, whether it's, you know, how, how does it, how does it, uh, how does it fit in? Well, um, in the spirit of Eric's suggestion to maybe clarify things for people who are great on demo or just prudence on M&A, but maybe could use a simpler version to follow the model, so I can do it if it's like, fed to me a bit more. I was thinking of your other co-author, Ryan Buff, the unfrozen caveman, who's, he's, he does a riff on him. I feel like the unfrozen caveman here, so I'm gonna tell you what I would need. Um, I'm just waking up from, you know, as a caveman. I need to actually understand, like, what control transactions are you talking about? Like, you didn't even mention it in the presentation today, but which control transactions? Because that's actually a really hot area of Delaware law right now, what we even mean by that. Um, and then I, I don't understand the manager in the model. Like, is this the manager manager? Is this the independent director? Or what's the relationship between the manager and the controlling shareholder? Because we're talking about control transactions. And in MFW, Eric mentioned the, it's supposed to be the uncoerced shareholder about this, you know, all of these specifications. But another thing about MFW is that it has to be specified up front that you have an independent committee and it can be challenged on the back end. So that made me really wonder about who this manager was that is getting the private benefits. Um, and then back to the what's the control transaction, um, I wonder, I really wanted to see that slide on the MFW implications because I'm, I'm really interested about that because right now currently being litigated are questions around how far MFW should be applied and I wonder, I, I have this feeling that your paper could have a really great impact on that doctrinal debate because um, it seems like your model is uh, mostly about freeze outs. And if so, that seems to say something about applying it to things like control or CEO compensation and other things like that. Thank you. All right. Uh, Holger, why don't you respond while others are thinking about more questions? And I particularly encourage the Europeans because we're just getting up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, so let me start with uh, the gold parachute, uh, oops, gold parachute question. Um, so gold parachute solves almost all of the problems in the, in the model, if you set it right. If you set it wrong, uh, you can get perverse effects uh, that then the manager is just trying to sell the firm even below value 
Um, that's it, it, analytically, it's exactly the same problem as setting the right beta, or for a call to figure out the the Goldilocks um, um, level of of the manager's share. Um, we don't explicitly model it, but clearly, yes, that would solve the the, 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 the situation. That would, would solve the problem. Um, Uma Kant and, and Elizabeth, I guess, both asked about you know which set of transactions uh, does the model apply to, and I apologize for not uh, saying that more clearly. But the answer is very simple: all. And we really try to make it about any control transaction, any time the company is taken out of the shareholder's hands into uh, some new ownership, regardless of the specifics um, of the structure, because uh, we, we, we we think that there is a common element to it this bargaining uh, problem is common to all ways of, of doing it. The details might then differ. Um, you know, maybe they don't vote, maybe they have to make a tender decision, and depending on how the tender is structured, tender can present different problems from the vote, but as a first approximation, and certainly with certain guardrails, it has a similar function as the vote, and so uh, we're thinking of it in the same way. Um, then when you get to um, go shops and other things that courts have used, we don't, again, we don't explicitly um, model those. We are assuming that when Revlon is in place, the courts have actually figured out ways of enforcing Revlon. Now this is, uh, the Revlon again says that if there is a sale, it has to be to the highest bidder. Now that sounds very easy, and if there were an open auction, it would be like, very mechanical. But of course, in reality, the issue is that bidders, they have to come out of the woodwork. Uh, and they can be deterred by giving a bonus to the first one to arrive at the scene. Sometimes that's even necessary to induce competition between bidders, so it actually gets pretty complicated in practice. And sort of a question of, I guess we could call it like a question of auction design and policing of the auction design by an auction designer who is actually an agent for a principal, a principal agent problem. So that is an interesting problem in and of itself that we bracket. We are assuming when we model Revlon, that Revlon has been perfectly implemented. So that among all the possible bidders, it really does go to the one bidder with the, with the, highest, uh, with the highest valuation, uh, sorry, subject to certain uh, constraints. Um, not because we think that that's always what happens. I mean, I personally am quite skeptical of the way many go shops are done, but um, we're sort of, like, like with the collective action problem for shareholders, we're thinking, let's imagine that's solved. And what do we get? What do we get? the spirit of the, uh, of the paper. Oh, uh, Elizabeth's um, MFW point. Yes, MFW has a special committee. It's an important part of it. And in the spirit of my Modigliani Miller point, so, uh, or you know, what other solutions are out there, if the special committee functions as it's supposed to function, where in the third? In fact, then we don't need any of the other stuff. And why do we have a shareholder vote? The special committee actually did its job and negotiated a great transaction. You can just let, let, let's go ahead. Okay. I guess we don't, the, the courts don't trust the special committee. Um, not many. Some perhaps yes, others not. And so again, we're asking the question, what if the special committee did not do its job? And we only have the shareholder vote. What then? Uh, and uh, well, first of all, the vote doesn't do the trick. And in fact, giving the controller the ability to condition the transaction on the vote really makes the ticket or leave it off a credit. Because otherwise, the controller could, after the negative share on the vote, say, ah, OK, I'll just do it myself. I own a majority of the stocks. I'm just going to vote this squeeze out through, and then you can sue me for appraisal or whatever. But if the controller has previously permitted not to do that, well, it makes the, uh, it makes the offer actually, it makes the ticket or leave it nature credible of this. Oh, uh, thank you, Holger. So it was, uh, yeah, I'm not here. <laughs> okay. So it was very stimulating. And also, uh, and actually, it was also kind of shocking in, uh, from Japanese perspective because um, Japanese idea of M&A law is if you follow their way, you will reach some kind of optimal <laughs> solution. Uh, but the, there's uh, like two, uh, two large differences between Japan and Delaware. Uh, one is that we don't have Leblon yet. Maybe we might in the future. We don't know. Uh, but but the, another big difference is the one that uh, Eric mentioned. So our appraisal remedy, uh, it allows shareholders to get some uh, synergy. Uh, so like, you know, if, there's, uh, if the deal is not paying us enough synergy, uh, shareholders can, you know, uh, descend to the uh, 
shareholders meeting and then can apply for applied sovereignty. So, um, so I just wondered what you're gonna, you know, what's your view on this uh, possibility that Eric plays? Uh, if it works well, it's a, you know, good news for Japan, but uh, if not, maybe you have to, yeah. have to follow level, maybe. Can I just quickly answer this? Yes, I will. So, Revlon, Revlon has one very important feature that makes the court's information problem easy. If the court might not know what's going on behind the scenes, but the court does know there's two bits on the table. One is high and one is low. Why is the manager taking the low one? And I mean, at least when you, if you can get those bits out, that's an easy task for a court to do in a way that checking what's going on in the side deals in the background is very hard for a court to do. So I think that, or we think that that's um, what, what Revlon does and why it is a useful um, doctrine to have. On, on the appraisal, I, I, I guess Eric already answered this question sort of, but you know, I guess you maybe sometimes modify the appraisal in depth. Just thinking about the representative uh, shareholder assumption. Uh, and uh, like, how do we think about that in the context of appraisal rights? Because how would something get voted through and then have someone call for appraisal rights? Uh, it just seems, I, I, I mean, I, I haven't seen the model, so, uh, so this may well be answered. And just like other questions like, you know, does this apply, does the model apply more to unanimous shareholders, or near unanimous, without asking for non, and mo many, most shareholder votes are pretty overwhelming, but is there is there a sense in which the model is applies to those rather than, you know, that subset that are more contested? First question, one, one word answer, squeeze out. Squeeze out, the, the, the appraisal makes sense, yes, the controller votes it through. All right, that was that. Thanks for <laughs>